So hello everyone, I am Zeynep from Hamburg uh, University of Technology. Today I will present our work which has the title of parameterization of the civil mobility model using contact traces and actually together with one of my colleague Manikandan. And so during the talk mainly I will focus on what is uh, small words in motion in short civil mobility model actually. And I will also talk a little bit about what is our motivation in this work and then would like to talk a bit about how we decide civil parameters using real life contact traces. Later on, my colleague will go through with the simulation results and conclusion and the future work. So what is small words in motion mobility model in short CIVIM? This is a um, synthetic mobility model implemented in Omnet++ to mimic human behavior. So this is uh, purely based on location preferences and we have very important two assumptions in this model. The first assumption, we assume that people usually go places which are very near to their home locations. And if they tend to go really far places from their home location, it means this place most likely to be a really popular place. So in Sivim, how we control where nodes move far places or close places and which location they have to decide is based on this straightforward formula. So C here is the particular location point and we assume that each location has a weight which is equal to this. So where the distance is the home location of each node and the C is the next location. Uh, so distance between these two locations and since C is the number of nodes that have been seen in that particular location during the experiment time, simulation time. And how we control to not to move far or um, really close by places is actually the based on this alpha value we can see. So this alpha is ranges between 0 and 1. It is a constant value for the every node in the network. And we can say, for example, if alpha is high, let's say 0 0.9, then we say during the simulation time, 90% of the time, nodes will only stay in their home location and only 10% of the time they will go really far places. So higher the alpha value, uh, the probability of choosing nearby places will be also higher. And this is a screenshot from Omnet uh, when the simulation, be before simulation starts. So we have a uh, number of nodes which are these uh, gray thing, uh, green things and we have this yellow dust. You can assign anywhere in the network. These are the places that move can move around and each node has a also neighborhood radius. So at the beginning of simulation, this neighborhood radius is a constant value you assign and it's the same for every node. And uh, the speed they move between locations are also same for each of them. And the alpha value is also assigned at the beginning and also constant value, same for every node. Only the waiting time, which node moves to a location, waits a little bit and then move to another location is different for each movement and for every node. And this uh, follows negative exponential. So what is our motivation here is uh, CIVIM is a location based, uh, location, pure location based model and we want to decide the CIVIM parameters like alpha or neighborhood area radius, how we can evaluate these values by using contact traces, real life traces. So for, from the contact traces we get is only the pairwise contact probabilities between two nodes. So we would like to see how we can decide the seven parameters based on that. In this work, we work with three different real life traces and these are actually mostly used in like most of the papers, very common ones. So Infocom 5, 6 and the Cambridge 5, but because of the time issue here, I think we will only see, show the results of one of these uh, traces. So what we can get from these contact traces is actually the only the number of contacts each node has with a particular another node in the network. And the traces mostly consist of huge number of nodes, like 90, 100 nodes. So I'm showing here a very small part of the network which consists of <coughs> only 10 nodes. This is our contact matrix and each element of the matrix represents how many times, for example, node 2 has contact with the node 4 during the simulation, during the experiment time. So because we always have the symmetricity in the contact traces, uh, uh, contact metrics, sorry, 
then if we sum up only the upper triangle of the matrix, then we can get the total number of contacts happened in the experiment. So if we divide each element by this number, then we can get the probability of each node having a contact with another particular node. But as we can see here, we still work with the node ID. So we can see exactly which node has how, uh, how much probability to get in contact with the another node, which actually doesn't make sense in SIVIM model because we need to get rid of the node IDs. What we can get from SIVIM is only how many nodes have been in that particular location during the time. So to get rid of this node IDs, we put those probabilities in an ascending order. And here in the graph, we wanted to see how we can drive these probabilities uh, how, how we can drive alpha based on these probabilities. So this graph, uh, we show a very two extreme cases actually, when alpha is zero and when alpha is one, which is actually never the real life case. So when alpha is one means like 100 percentage of the time, these nodes have been in their home location. They never went any other location. So if the neighborhood radius and R is not overlapping with any other nodes radius, then it means any node will not see any, any other node. So the contact probability will be zero for each node. But if we make this neighborhood radius with overlapping with some of the nodes radius, then we can see the graph is increasing because some nodes, when they are in home location still 100% of the time, they have some overlap radius with the other nodes that they can contact still, even though they are in the home location. So that's why we have this increasing behavior. But if we say alpha is zero for everyone, so they will never be in home location, but they will really move around the network and far places. And if you run the simulation really long enough, then every node will see every other node in the network, that means. Then the probability of for each node will be equal for all of them. So because I show uh, a result for 10 nodes here, so we have 45 node pairs in this graph. That's why here is the 45, and the probability is one over 45. But if we, if we see how this looks in the real life traces, for example, this is from Cambridge 2005, we can just see the behavior looks really similar with the behavior here we see in the blue one, which the neighborhood radius is most probably overlapping. Okay, we cannot say alpha is one, but we can say alpha is really high because like we can say two thirds of the not pairs has not uh, seen each other, they didn't have contact, or they had really, really less contact, but some node pairs has really contact during the, uh, during the experiment time. That means we can just get a um, conclusion by looking at this graph that when the more nonlinearity in the graph, then alpha is higher. If the graph is really flat, then that means alpha is really low, like a thumb rule we can guess. But here we still don't know how long how much alpha is high, uh, high really, like 1 or 0 0.9. So to see that with the simulation results, I think my colleague will explain. Thank you. Yeah. OK, so uh, as my colleague explained, uh, we kind of sort of uh, derived or uh, ended up with a thumb rule, which is necessarily like uh, more linear the graph is, lower the alpha value is, and uh, more the nonlinearity in the curve, uh, higher the alpha values. That's sort of the thumb rule we derived uh, in our work. So we'll directly go to the simulation results, or first, the simulation parameters. So uh, we simulated three different races, Infocom 2005, six and Cambridge 2005 <coughs> and we uh, derived most of these parameters uh, to match with the real life traces as much as possible and in this work our emphasis is mainly on deciding the alpha value. Okay, so first we see the Infocom 2005 trace. Uh, so the red line which is actually the contact, uh, no pairwise contact probability uh, of the actual real life trace. And 
we simulated for multiple alpha values just to see the effect of alpha value on the con uh, pairwise contact probabilities. We can see that uh, the alpha equal to zero, that is, that means uh, we visit only the popular locations. We can see that the curve is uh, very flat or nearly flat, the blue line, which is hidden be behind the black line. And for alpha equal to one, which is the other extreme case, that is, uh, we visit only the uh, locations which are near to the home locations, that is the locations with our, uh, which are only within the neighborhood radius, we can see that uh, there is clearly a rise in the curve and uh, because the sum of the probabilities is, is one, when there is a rise here, the, there is a fall here. And uh, we can see that uh, as alpha increases, we can, uh, there is a clear uh, non-linearity increase in all the curves. We can see the same pattern for different alpha values. That's what we observe. And to see another real life trace, we show the Cambridge 2005. Uh, the red line, which is the actual real life trace, uh, and the all the other alpha values. Oh, sorry. Okay. For alpha equal to zero, we can see that the curve is uh, really flat, and just like the previous graph, we can see that for a higher alpha value, uh, we can see uh, there's a non-linearity in the curve towards the end of the graph. And uh, yeah, here, it uh, when this goes up and this comes down. Uh, so the thing with this is uh, we chose a, a purely graphical approach for deciding the alpha value. So uh, we cannot exactly decide the alpha value, but we can say, uh, how, I mean, uh, the range of alpha values. I mean, we can say if the curve is completely flat or nearly flat, we can say that alpha is very low. So we can uh, easily guess the alpha value for the simulation. So since we have seen the alpha value and the effects of alpha values on the pairwise contact properties, we'll show a uh, few other results. Okay. So uh, this is contact durations. So we just wanted to see if it is uh, following the same results as presented in the other works. That is, uh, that is a power law up to a certain uh, cutoff point and a negative uh, exponential for I mean negative exponential after the certain cutoff point. So uh, we found that uh, both contact durations and intercontact times followed the same uh, patterns which were seen in all the other previous works. And uh, we also saw that uh, uh, the contact durations which follow the same pattern like uh, the real life traces. Okay, so now we see some uh, differences between the swim model and the real life traces. So. Uh, the real life traces, they actually have uh, day and night time differences. That is uh, low activity during the uh, night times and high activity during the day times. Or some in some traces, it was the other way. Uh, but uh, due to the uh, like inherent design in the swim model, uh, that is actual swim model, they, do, they have not uh, uh, introduced night time or day time into the uh, swim model. So we can see that the activity level is uh, very uh, homogeneous and it does not have the uh, diurnal patterns or the day uh, night patterns in the swim model. That's uh, one thing that's not there in the swim model. And uh, this, these graphs are uh, also like activity level, but in a per node basis, like a uh, number of contacts per hour per node. So it's like uh, the traffic encountered by each node per hour. Like, so this is for Cambridge 2005. Uh, so uh, we observed that there's a very high frequency of zero contacts per hour for each node. And we also observed that uh, towards the end of the graph, uh, we have a, uh, the actual frequencies are very low, but we still have, oh sorry, we still have some uh, frequencies towards the end of the graph. But uh, in the swim simulations, we found that uh, we did have zero contacts per hour for some nodes, but 
the frequency was not as high as the actual real life traces and to see the uh, same graph in a different manner we plotted it as a complementary cumulative distribution so you can clearly see uh, how much of uh, high number of contacts is there actually in the real life traces we found we found the same patterns in the other two traces also uh, so it's like uh, in the real life traces this uh, zero number of contacts represented the night times actually so during the night times the nodes did not meet any any other nodes there so there were uh, zero contacts per hour and this high high number of contacts if you see this graph uh, you can see that uh, even though the probability is very low and like for example if you take this last data point uh, this means uh, a node had a very high number of contacts in a particular hour uh, but it was it didn't happen that often so uh, that means uh, there is different uh, there's different behavior uh, based on the time of the day. So uh, the traces are actually very, very heterogeneous in nature in terms of uh, time of the day. So uh, that was very much missing in the SWIM model. So there is a, there is a need to program each and every node uh, separately uh, with different parameters in the SWIM model so that uh, we can introduce the heterogeneity into the uh, yeah, swim model results. Okay, now to the conclusion. Okay, the main emphasis of this work was to show that we can use pairwise contact probabilities uh, uh, to actually match with uh, location based models, that is, uh, for example, swim model. So, uh, normally, uh, Location based traces are used to match location based models, but we wanted to show that even pairwise contact probabilities can be used. That's why we had a, a special way of uh, uh, calculating the pairwise contact. That's we sorted the values in ascending order, and also we found that uh, swim model needs heterogeneity at a per node level, like uh, each node needs to be programmed very, very specifically. And for future work, uh, we are yeah we have to represent uh, day and night. That can be done by tuning the al tuning the alpha value, the neighborhood radius. Uh, there are a few other parameters inside the swim model. That's like uh, so we have to tune those for each and every node. And uh, yeah, since this is a very graphical approach, we found as uh, as like the starting point of using pairwise contact probabilities. Uh, future work we are planning to do some mathematical model for exactly predicting the or uh, somewhat exactly predicting the uh, alpha value from pairwise contact probabilities and uh, yeah uh, main part of heterogeneity is that uh, the neighborhood radius is a single uh, entity so there, there's a need for introducing fine divisions into neighborhood radiuses so that we can have multiple probabilities of visiting uh, multiple places. Uh, so uh, these are some of the future works which are in the plan. So the references, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you to, <laughs> to Mani Kandan and to Zainab as well. Uh, we have time for a very quick question. Any question for the audience? Yes. So the term of contact probabilities has been very central to your talk. Um, I don't think I understand what the contact probability is actually a probability for. Does it mean it's the probability for this pair to meet in one hour or in, like there has to be some time unit involved? Or yes, uh, because it is taking from the real life traces, so it is during the whole experimental time. Okay, but um, if you go back to the slide where you introduced the data from the experiment, it was quite in the beginning. Um, that one, yes. Mm -hmm. So you said that you counted or summed up all the numbers in the upper right half mm -hmm. uh, ma matrix and then divided the number by the total amount. Mm -hmm. 
But then that's not a probability for this meeting occurring, right? Because if you go to the next slide, for example, one and two have a probability now of 1%. But they actually met 22 times or 13 times or some, something. Where so is this? Uh, the topmost non zero number, yes. So, so the probability is 0 0.01. Yeah, go back one slide. But they actually met Thir 13 yeah. times but during the whole experiment. But yeah. then the numbers on the next slide are not probabilities for the meeting. <coughs> it's a probability if you take one contact that's that it's a contact between no, uh, node 0 and 2. Uh, or one and two. I, I'm. So do you it's, it's just normalized. It's not really mm -hmm. probabilities, right? No, but they just try to normalize to get the probability. Okay. Yes, uh -huh. Ah, okay. Yes. Also, you ask yeah. for the time and it's for the whole experiment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, so thanks again. Give it up for. <laughs> <laughs>